Colorado is picture perfect. Not just because of the mountains. Well, that's just too obvious. Yeah, we call it the uh, Tibetan prayer flip-flop. Shirley, Delta, whoa! I just keep stroking this eyeball like this, like, shh, come on, girl. There's beauty behind our artist's brushes, the poetry. And the performers that make our state so cultured and awesome. It was a lot of fun. Hi, welcome to the Nine News Art Special. I'm Nelson Garcia. And I'm the not super comfortable in front of the camera, Ann Herbst. We're in Denver's Rhino Arts District, surrounded by these incredible murals. Ann and I are about to introduce you to a bunch of people who, through their art, make the places in Colorado interesting. Like, let's take Creed, Colorado, for instance. Have you ever heard of it? It's one of my favorite places after covering this story. Small towns are notorious for their characters. It's a poodle in the doodle. They're also known for old-fashioned ideas. I like talking to neighbors. Better than Facebook. It's still a thing here in Creed, Colorado. If we're going to argue about something, we'll just put it aside and talk about the weather in Creed. So when they planned an art show highlighting the inspiration around them, just look around. They looked past the obvious and focused on what they find even more beautiful. The opportunity just to have the whole town willing to be painted. Katrina took on the challenge. It's hard to pass up. <laughs> to paint the town. Uh, a lot of beards, a lot of plaid, a lot of personalities. 172 portraits. Uh, here I am, holy cow. Rita Odom smiles with her entire body. I didn't know I ever smiled that big, but that smile just takes you in. I like it. <laughs> she made my eyes crazy green, which is wonderful because that's the way I think of my eyes. But <laughs> the exhibit is called Be the Art. <laughs> we are an art exhibit. Like John, the school principal over there with the Fender guitar. This is Benjamin. Uh, he actually goes by the name Ben Jammin because he didn't like any of the other nicknames associated with Benjamin. I'm just stunned. I'm just stunned. Manuel and Anne Zadate okay. cooked up this idea. We want to basically turn this into a year-round arts community. Everyone was able to pay what they can for their portrait. And whether that's $10 or $1,000 or $10,000. <laughs> the money goes to the National Winter Playwrights Retreat. This is so amazing. Look at Delma. Funding artists from all over to spend a week in Creed, writing and enjoying the outdoors. And it's beginning to change the winter commerce and make a difference in the lives of people who really struggle in the wintertime when there's no tourism. But I feel like I know them just because I've been staring at their faces. <laughs> Katrina is from Portland, painting faces she doesn't even recognize because she's Manuel's favorite artist. Okay, so I'm a little biased here because she's my daughter. <laughs> and she did it all for free. I believe anyone should be able to get art. I feel like it should be, I'd love to see art in every person's household. Art, funding, art. My eyes are closed. Bringing warmth to Creed oh. in the coldest months. Happy Valentine's Day. Oh, wow. <laughs> Hard to talk, because he just died a few days ago, so, wow. Well. That makes this painting even more special, that he's in it. I think that everybody here has creed in common more than whatever our differences might be. Just an appreciation for everybody in this town. To me, this is about what America should be about. It's America. You know. America. Smiling through differences. Helping each other and loving their dogs, of course. It's great when our communities come together like that. Especially when people reach out to help their community, like in this next story by Katie Eastman and Chris Hansen. And their little art pieces on their own. I mean, they're, they're beautifully made. Layers of a painting include lines, shape. Be really bad if I misspelled something. And texture. And now I've just misspelled deputy, just so you know, because I'm talking. At least that's what Charlene <laughs> Goldman was taught. She added her own layer. It's all about love. 
That is the painting. That's always the first one. This canvas is covered with badges borrowed from Colorado first responders. I think 34 altogether. Unlike anything she's ever created. Alrighty. But like all her paintings. I love you too. Love is how it begins. Okay. Nay, nay. Okay. And she really catches the... Uh, Charlene fell for Mark three years ago. What sort I'm looking for? You know, the emotion or the, the atmosphere of the moment. A painting of his police motorcycle meant I love you. I had no idea she was going to paint it. She saw beauty. They're exquisite. Where he saw routine. I was the 86th person hired in 1982. I, I never looked at it as art. It's something that I'm proud of and always have been because, you know, we earned it. But I never looked at it as art, and she sees art in everything. Even on days like this when beauty is tough to see. I still feel the emotion, you know, every time I think about it. The day a Douglas County deputy gave his life on the job. The newscast and the pictures really struck me and, you know, hit me hard. Charlene saw this face and felt compelled to paint it. In some ways, that's how I cope with things in life. Trying to stand at attention, trying to hold salute, with tears coming down, mm -hmm. but still trying to maintain, you know, that kind of stoic look. Mark knows the expression um, well. The countless police funerals I've ridden in with tears. And uh, I think that, you know, the, that, that picture captured that almost perfectly of all the emotion involved. It still comes back even two decades after Mark lost his close friend. The other guy was hiding in a hallway with a rifle, and when Bruce peeked around the corner, he got shot. And then a gunfight ensued. A fellow Denver police officer. Um, and I saw what his wife went through. That was a lot of motivation why the Fallen Hero Foundation, I think, is a wonderful thing. These people help make the world go round. This painting is for them to raise money for the families left behind. But you can't, you can't dwell on it or nothing's going to get done. You're just going to cry. There is more than one layer of love in Charlene's painting. I just want to pay homage to those who gave up their badges. The love of art itself. I certainly wouldn't be doing it if I didn't love it. Love of the man who inspired it. It's a piece of your heart that you're giving away. And a love for the person behind every badge. It's, uh, it's something personal that, you know, she's given from her heart. From paintbrushes to pen on paper, there are so many ways to express yourself. The people that Amma Arthur Ozma and I met in our next story create their art using written words and life experiences most of us can't imagine. What's wrong with him, they all say. Well, they never spent a homeless day. Though they're just words. It's tough, I'll tell you, but press on because from the spirit, your strength is drawn. These words come from somewhere unexpected not just the Denver Public Library. So if you feel like you want to whine, just help somebody else out. You'll be fine. But literally, from people who believe being homeless does not mean being hopeless. It's not hopeless, it's hopeful. John Olander is one of many. Everybody that comes to this class calls it the best day of the week. Tuesday, I came in and boom, everything just totally changed my life. They joined the Hard Times Writers Workshop. Uh, I want to welcome everybody. This is an open workshop. Put on at no cost every Tuesday by a nonprofit called Lighthouse um, for a population looking for a voice. People experiencing homelessness or poverty, people who are overcoming addictions or mental health struggles. Instructor Jane Thatcher uh, wants to challenge us. people. I mean, we're learning, we're being instructed, but we're also getting a lot more information, right? While so empowering them. It's inspiring. It gives me an opportunity to explore express my own creativity. Creativity from people right off the streets. But I live in a shed at a church. The amount of talent in here is just so much more than you could ever imagine. I've never written before. I'm almost 65 years old. Manifested from some who never knew they had these words in them. The time has come that I have feared to bid mom a final adieu. Really nice bifurcated pills. 
and sell them at the counters for obscene amount of beer. Walk, bills. dance, lay, or stand in that light. <coughs> know you are. Simply be. And when they come here, they say it's not just their writing skills that grow. That I'm actually trying to write a memoir. Deb Barris says her confidence grows. And I'm not doing it every day, but I'm doing it. It has, in other areas of people's lives, helped them to focus, to engage, to build relationships. And the hope is... I cut my heart on random pieces of broken glass. These are skills. Man, that's heavy duty. That will help keep these people right off the streets. Anybody else back here want to share? Off the streets. It helps people retain their self-esteem. Let the fellas in. It's time to exterminate. <laughs> oh. Oh, that happened to me this morning. Yeah. Forget yeah. about the past, because it won't last. It's already gone and it left fast. Turning their wrongs into rights. About what's there for people that are homeless, it's cathartic. It gives them something to look forward to. Because to live the life you want to live, you must be committed to give, give, give. Next up, we're taking a hard turn. I'm getting a little weird. Weird like you. Nope. Weird like an art installation made of flip-flops weird. Stay with us. One of the things we wanted to do here was to deal with the, the tragic loss of flip-flops in Boulder Creek. Welcome back. As promised, we're going to get a little bit out of the box in this segment. Noel Brennan's gonna take you to Boulder, where flip-flops are so much more than the things I wear when I'm feeling too lazy to tie my shoes. It's just a lovely place to be. An artist knows inspiration ebbs and flows. So when it flows, Tom Blumenthal yep. seizes the opportunity because he knows it might not come again. Yeah, this is my first piece and it's also my last piece. I've been coming down here and collecting trash from the creek every few days for 20 years. Mostly beer cans, sometimes soda cans. But for some reason, I started collecting the shoes, the flip-flops mostly. Stray flip-flops. All of these flip-flops washed up right here. Now strung together from trees along Boulder Creek. Yeah, we call it the uh, Tibetan prayer flip-flop. One of the things we wanted to do here was to deal with the, the tragic loss of flip-flops in Boulder Creek. 231 swept away, saved by Tom. This is like your children, you know, you can't pick a favorite flip-flop. Just what you'd expect a sandal savior to say. Oh, some of them have really fallen apart. Well, here's a couple of pink ones and this one, look at the shiny stuff on here. That's pretty impressive. Look at the thickness of that one. It's made of, I don't know what. It's a lot of it, though. Tom would never wear any of these. I hate having anything between my toes. But he gets a kick out of displaying them and playing artist for a day. Actually, my wife is an accomplished artist, and my father was also an accomplished artist, and my sister is an accomplished artist, but not me. I'm a professor at the University of Colorado. Molecular biology and genetics. Art is in the eye of the beholder. It really is something. Especially in Boulder. What exactly, I'm not sure, but it's something. Our next story takes place right here. Right here in Rhino. Right here. Right here. Right here. Where a group called the Ladies Fancy Work Society was putting up a mural of their own. About 10 years ago, I did a story on these ladies right when they were first getting started. It was really fun watching Brian Wenland's story to see what they're up to now. People get so excited to see something totally different up there. If different is your thing. I just keep stroking this eyeball like this, like, shh, come on, girl. These are your girls. <laughs> That's true. We did. And this. Her name's Tina. Is your monster. She's a monster. Tina. You crocheted her out of yarn. And love. And love. In a sea of spray paint, Jessie, Lauren, Jess, and Timela broke out the yarn. Love is an open door. door. 
and the songs. Oh, you noticed? You noticed that? You noticed Frozen. Weird. This quartet is the Ladies Fancy Work Society. Are we adding this? Yeah. And they've been working on Tina since April. She had a long, what did we say? Gestation, gestation period. A relatively yeah. short gestation period for how big she is. Um, okay, let's move her over. Um, Senora Benissima. The crocheted monster is their third crush installation. She's hungry. Second in a row at Matchbox on Larimer. Tina! And one of many projects they've completed since forming their yarn syndicate in 2007. Do you want to see our gang tattoos? Oh, we have tats. You look so good, Tina. Tina really is different. Love is a crocheted monster named Tina. But if you're staring into her eyes looking for some deep meaning? God, I wish. Oh, no. Mm -mm. I really wish. <laughs> You'll be staring for a while. We want to make people smile. I'm That's in. deep. I'm in it for smiles, yeah. yeah. I think we did it. Brian Wendland, 9 News. Group by five. That monster is adorable. And so is the kid in this next story by Alma Arthur Ozma. Meet Britton Gray. My name's Britton Gray. I'm five years old, and a meal behind me is of me, and this is good news. It's pretty cool that I have a meal and it's big. My face is just the white size, and my shape's the white size. My mom said, well, and my dad said, that's ginormous, and my grandpa said nothing. Probably on Saturday, I'm gonna have a play day with one of my friends, and I'm probably gonna say to my mom, can you take me to the mail so I can show my friends? Left, white, dog. <laughs> I think I'm a celebrity because I have a meal, and soon people are going to become seeing it. And soon I'm going to be signing autographs. You will go down with the camera. Shows my personality. What's your personality? My personality is like, I pretty much don't know yet. I like that I have a meal. Good, pretty good. I love that kid. That's one of my favorite stories I've seen this year. But you've got a favorite that you've done though, right? Yep, and that's coming up next. Welcome back. So Anne, this is one of your favorites. Yeah, and I'm gonna come right out and say it. It's about a local drag queen, and I'll never forget her and the things she's doing to help our community. <laughs> Tonight's gonna be a great show. I mean, it's sold out. Finding your place in this world can take a while. <laughs> right. <laughs> a lot longer than it takes Stuart Sanks. Shirley Delta Blow. To become. And I'll. Shirley. You'll see me in my full glory in just a moment. Stuart is definitely comfortable in his own skin. Tight gowns. <laughs> And even though drawing in eyebrows at the right angle is super challenging. Oh, it makes you look really crazy. Like you're totally surprised the whole time. He loves it. Like this, like the whole time. All this to host the Drag Decade show at Denver's Clock Tower Cabaret for sold out crowds. If we didn't have an audience, this would be like in my bedroom in junior high, like singing, singing Madonna and Cindy Lauper. It's no different, right? Shirley Delta. Stuart morphs into Carefree Shirley in just a few hours. But it took him years to find the courage to do it. I grew up in, you know, Kansas in a pretty conservative, you know, home. For most of the part, you know, growing up in Kansas, it wasn't okay to be gay. And so that was lots of really kind of scary, sad, depressing times. But it's, it's been a process, constantly becoming you know, who I am today. A process he hopes is less of a struggle for those in his audiences. Whether they're drinking Jack and Coke or chocolate milk. Remember in our multiplication, we practice 12 times six. I think an audience of third graders can be actually more terrifying than a room full of drunk adults. Stewart, <laughs> Mr. Stewart to them, teaches third grade at the studio school in Thornton. Would you lean over to your sh shoulder partner and say, hey there. Hey. 
This morning's subject is math. We're estimating, so we're just going to come close. Mixed with lessons about kindness and acceptance. He allows us to be like, like open. If you try to like make your, yourself something that you're not, it just, it doesn't show people like the real you. The kids also learn about one of Mr. Stewart's favorite subjects. Yeah, yeah, he's playing 80s music. It is a group called Wham. Kind of like it, but it's weird. Music aside, they know their teacher totally rocks. He does love unicorns. <laughs> he's so great. He's like, woo, woo. He's magical. He's fun. He's one of a kind, one in a million. So I want to say to, to students, you will make the world a better place, not by being somebody else, but by being exactly who you are. My favorite animal of all time has to be a lion. Because actually, my mother says it's my spirit animal. When you've got your sentence at your table, stand up. As for what Mr. Stewart's bosses think of his extracurriculars, I am the principal of the studio school. They don't bat an eye. It just has a way of just bringing everybody together and making sure that they feel accepted and supported. He really inspires them to be who they are. Um, all the parents that have communicated directly with me have been really cool about all the different things that I do outside. Which all comes together in one grand glitter explosion when Mr. Stewart Can you hear me okay? meets Shirley. Okay, let me get situated here. It's tough to find a seat at his story hour at Denver's book bar. Gotta come in for a landing. <laughs> and I like to read stories about times when we need just some reminders that there's lots of people in the world who love us exactly the way that we are. Even as an egg, Dino Duckling was different. Boom, boom, crunch. The audience is younger and maybe a little less attentive. The message is still the same. And we all fit in. As parents say, they want their kids to be happy. So we just have to kind of, you know, give them the tools to make those decisions and kind of stand back and let them let them decide what that's going to look like. And sometimes that looks like a third grade teacher. Okay. Attempting to teach his kids about the 80s. They shouted out the Beatles for everything. You know, who's this? It's the Beatles. I was like, this is two women. <laughs> sometimes finding yourself. How are we doing? Is a little flashier. The steps it takes to get to each place might look a little different. But Stewart's figured out who he is. Different didn't make any difference to her. And he hopes everyone in his audience can find their Mr. Stewart side. All right, put your finishing touch on your list. And Miss Shirley side. Whatever that means for them. It was a lot of fun. Make this world a better place. Happier, you know, sparklier. Mm. Oh, you're so sweet. Nelson. You can dance like that, right? Of course. Nope. <laughs> Thanks for watching the Night News Art Special. Happy holidays, and may you always be as cool as the people we featured in this special. And never as dorky as us. Him. chapters of American history. I started finding these personal stories that really brought everything to life. To the frolics. I'm coming! I'm coming! Oh. <laughs> of a frisky French national. A ski Antoine. Over there is Maroubelle. A ski behind is Castle Peak. We bring you stories of triumph. I knew you learning to read was a good thing. I didn't think it would make you famous. <laughs> we bring you struggles of survival. It was just like, surprise, you have brain cancer. These are stories from around our state. That looks beautiful. Stories that make Colorado in 2018. Wife gets mad because I remember nothing she tells me, but I remember every shoe I touched. It's an honor to meet you. Memorable. <laughs> Nelson, it's time to shoot the Storyteller Special. Is that time of year already? Wow, another year has gone by, Anne, and as always, you look another year younger. 
I wish I could say the same for you. Thanks. Our first story is about a man who's 94 years old and a part of American history. Tucked away in a home near the top of Lookout Mountain. My memorabilia room. Is a place full of history. Right at Camp Hale at that time. A place full of the story of Dick Over. Those are things that have been honoring me, I guess. Honors for what he did as a member of the Army's 10th Mountain Division during World War II, forged in the Colorado Mountains at Camp Hale near Leadville. In order to defend this country, we would have to have mountain troops, troops trained for uh, winter combat. And uh, we were very successful. So successful. So right up here, we've got some of the oral histories. The Denver Public Library has become a repository of memorabilia. This row, this row, and then this side. For the 10th Mountain Division. I really think that everything in here does have historical value. Kelly Schmidt yeah. is the archivist of it all. The 10th Mountain Division was incredibly talented. They taught soldiers how to fight on skis. I started finding these personal stories that really brought everything to life. No idea at that time that it would develop like it has and uh, it, it changed my life. But over time. No, it was not easy. Some of the history is getting lost. We're a, uh, a dying group simply because of our age. That's why Schmidt's mission is to preserve it. This is the flag I was telling you about. Like this Nazi flag taken. You can see there's a captain there. And signed by 10th Mountain Division soldiers as a trophy of victory. It brings it to life. It makes it real. You know, you can feel this cloth and know that that symbol represented more than just a horrible picture in a book. But out of all the things. Dick Overs collection. It's the words that Schmid wants to say. We are about ready to get underway. The words of those recognized time and again. It's an honor to meet you. Thank you. We have a great evening in store for you. One that's filled with countless stories guaranteed to both inspire and entertain. The words of the people who are history. Here are two of them in real life, real time, right here. Colonel Gregory Anderson is a deputy commander of the current 10th Mountain Division living the legacy that Over helped build. The division just returned back from Iraq, where we were supporting operations to defeat ISIS. Though veterans like Over. How are you tonight? I'm hanging in there. Man, you're an inspiration. Can be honored at events like the Colorado Museum Snow Sports Hall of Fame. You copycat. Preserving their stories in their words is important. It's a source of courage. Hey, people have done worse. We can do this. Right now, I'm going to show you the oral history collection that we've just had digitized. Last year, Schmid won a grant. Experiencing what they saw, what they heard directly through them. To digitize the oral histories of the 10th Mountain we, we Division. We dug our guns in. There was snow in the ground. They are making these stories available online. And the whole dock area was pretty well bombed out. So this part of history will never be lost. And that's the time when they take a, taken the blankets out of our packs in order to wrap the dead. Stories from soldiers and, and a few from loved ones. She talks about her time during World War II so while her husband was away. First, when he walked in, I almost died. <laughs> he was so handsome. A type of history of that is experienced. His head was blown open like a watermelon out here. And his brother came by later and said, that's my brother. There were moments when he would stop and you could hear his voice crack and you knew he was, he was trying not to break down in tears. The good against evil. Because not everyone can meet history face to face. We haven't forgotten it. With photojournalist Mike Grady, <laughs> Nelson Garcia, Nine News. Here we are in the glorious Nine News break room where we often share books on this little card here. What was the last book that you've read, Anne? The Art of War? Because that's what it's like being around you all the time then you must have read The Art of Lame. Our next story is about a girl who doesn't take reading for granted. In the first chapter of this mystery, the scene is set, the characters revealed, and the answers in the clues, as long as you know how to read them. <laughs> Solving Ruth's mystery, 
begins with sexy celebrities. Big children! And like any good mystery, <laughs> there's a red herring. One misleading clue that throws everyone off the case. Her mom's seen it happen. She's such a smart young woman. And people don't expect that. I'm sure a lot of people don't expect that. People got distracted by Ruth's Down syndrome. Big children. Safe men in life. And assumed reading wasn't for her. The country superstar. Of course they were the... wrong and missed the most obvious hint. Ooh, I love cameras. I don't love cameras. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> she is the one that wants to be the movie star. <laughs> but in chapter two, Lisa Tischer pieces together that unlikely part of the puzzle. I get to figure out everybody's mystery and, and try to figure out, you know, what you have and how do I make that grow. Oh, let's see. Yeah. Which one do you want? Lisa met Ruth as a sixth grader. You ready? She began the detective work right away. And see what it says. While the investigating is different for every kid. Can I hear your voice? The promise is always the same. Every kid will read. It's an M, so what's it gonna say? Lisa read Ruth's clues. From her love of Blake Shelton to her movie star dreams. She wanted to read about actors and actresses and she wanted to be, you know, go re <laughs> read all the celebrity magazines. Sure, if that's what you wanna do, let's, okay, I'll teach you how to read those things. And in chapter three, more than a decade later, Ruth's mystery is better than solved. Hi. <laughs> hey, girly! Hey, hey, yeah. hey, how are you, Ruth? I brought you some flowers. I heard you were an important lady. Once a month on Saturdays, Ruth is the star of story time at Book Bar. <laughs> Lisa came to watch her student shine. From far away, the earth looks so small. The once shy 12 year old would make Blake Shelton proud. I knew you learning to read was a good thing. I didn't think it would make you famous. Yeah. <laughs> now, she's a confident and well-read 23-year-old. Wee! I love playing kids with my friends. Ruth reads to kids who have yet to solve their mysteries. But I can hear them. The clues are all here. <laughs> <laughs> Ruth knows how to read them, and so will they. I hope that they'll look at her and say, I can do that too. The end. With photojournalist Ann Herbst, Katie Eastman, mm -hmm. Nine News. Coming up next, a story about an unfamiliar game making rounds in Denver. It's quite a zen-like game in some ways. And a story about a man who's conquered the mountains. Many people say, hey, Jean, give me a the book. Yeah, I read the book, I read the book. I don't have no time to read the book. The best stories can transport you to somewhere else. Nelson, have you ever been to... France? Actually, I have. My aunt lives there. Our next story is actually about a guy they call Frenchy. Okay, no problem. Everybody follow me. Get ready for a gnarly ride. This dude rips. Hey, I'm Jacques Roux. <laughs> they call me Frenchy. I am uh, 41, uh, 41 years old, each leg. A guy 82. People have been chasing this old man in the mountains around Aspen since he moved here from France in the 70s. Over there is Sopus, a, a ski that one. Over there is Maroubel, a ski behind his castle peak. I, I ski a lot of, uh, a, a lot of mountain. 82 years old, as Jacques keeps moving. He ditched his filter a long time ago. Uh, yeah, it's tough, sure it's tough, but uh, I love it. And I kick my ass and I claim a lot of mountain. Sure, he can ride, but his charisma is what got the attention of Carbondale filmmaker Michelle Smith. Oh, I love Michelle. Too bad she's married. <laughs> he says every time you laugh, you add one extra year to your life. She wants to do something about an old guy who keeps moving. <laughs> Five Point Film Festival's Night of Stoke is the kind of evening you rock chacos instead of heels. They're 82 years old. Here I found her. Jacques. Oh, the love of your life. <laughs> Michelle and Jacques' new friend. Oh, are in the house for a screening of Michelle's film, The French, 
a tale too big for one person to tell. Many people say, hey, Jacques, give me to write the book. Yeah, write the book, write the book. I don't have no time to write a book. She did that, and that was like, that is like a book. <laughs> My dad actually passed away suddenly from sudden cardiac arrest about two years ago, and, and I was worried about the aging process, and, and you know, and then you meet somebody like Jacques, who, who you know, Stop. acts like he's 41 years old in each leg. More, more, more muscle. A lot of the pull for telling the story for me was just to show that you don't have to worry about getting old and live life and have fun and laugh a lot. <laughs> As the movie wraps up, Michelle steps into the spotlight, and Jacques... I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming! Oh, <laughs> Frenchie's climbed all those mountains. This little guy? Psh, no problem. Thank you! I can't see you now! I can't see you now. After summoning the stage, he drops some knowledge. You cannot give up and keep moving, and that's it. Off stage, Jacques gives a humble merci to the woman who told his story. <laughs> Michelle, thank you again. Yeah. No, really, no, really. Yeah. You are something in, 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 in my heart, you know? Good. You're kidding. I, I, I'm flattered, thank you. The montagna. The mountain. La puta, que la montagne est belle. Life's been a long ride for Jacques. He hopes to keep going, keep inspiring, and keep laughing. Just pardon his French. The day I die, I'm going to laugh, then maybe I don't die. <laughs> I'll be on the confession, no, not yet. <laughs> this is my. <laughs> you know, you meet somebody like that, and, and it's like, I'm not afraid to get old. For that, I'm glad. I motivate people to keep moving. Mike Grady, 9 News. This is our sports department. With all the TVs in here, it looks like a bar. I don't know what kind of bar you're going to, but I bet they never show croquet on these screens. Not even the world championships? <laughs> not even those. Our next story is about the not-so-popular sport finding a home in Denver. What's to not like about being in this park? This is croquet paradise in here. Stillness interrupted only by a few meditative clicks. It's quite a zen-like game in some ways. A perfect time to play a centuries-old sport. That looks good right there. Where athletes do fancy things like quote famous poets. Emily Dickinson said, I dwell in possibility. Players treat each other with grace. That looks beautiful. And speak in hushed tones. Ready to get your butt kicked? Okay, <laughs> not really. <laughs> Oh. A few times a week, the Denver Croquet Club takes over a small lawn and wash park. Nice hoop. To compete for points. Great, great hit. And occasionally, <laughs> loudest player. Who's the loudest person here? Judy. Daniel's the loudest person here. She doesn't know what she's talking about. <laughs> Daniel, Judy, and about 50 others make up this club that plays under the summer sun. I'm out here a lot, and I, I, I'm Greek, so I tan well, so that's mostly it. <laughs> It might look a little confusing. And you want to learn how to play a jump shot? James will break it down. The first ball through the hoop owns the point, and there's only one point per hoop. Once that hoop is scored, everybody goes on to the next one. This is the George Bush version of croquet. No one gets left behind. Everyone gets a turn, but for Daniel... <laughs> How's my hair? <laughs> this ain't amateur hour. This guy in the tank top is the like number 20 ranked guy in the country. So that's pretty good, pretty quick. I, uh, I, I worked really hard at it. So I stayed down in West Palm Beach for about uh, five months living in a cheap hotel. And I trained six to nine hours a day, seven days a week, including Thanksgiving and Christmas. The group welcomes players of Daniel's caliber. Nice shot. And anyone else, really. We love playing the game. We love sharing it with people. I've known people playing it in their 90s. It, you know, as long as you're upright, <laughs> you can play it. I thought it was going to be like really, you know, white shorts and really kind of like a little exclusive and everybody was so friendly. <laughs> as the shadows settle in and the sun quiets the players with its soothing, fiery glow, they return to quoting those who know a thing about a civilized, peaceful evening. Martha Stewart said, Croquet is an iconic piece of an American summer's day. <laughs> Anne Herbst, 
9 News. After the break, a story about a man keeping a lost trade alive. It hasn't changed. I mean, the machines that I work on still look the same. And a fight for life portrayed through art. Welcome back. In our business, we often find ourselves telling stories that are difficult to tell, but they are a part of real life. Our next story is about a woman using art to share a compelling, personal struggle. I feel American, but I'm Congolese. That is the blood that runs through my veins. A life in the I shadows here, is still a life with a story to a tell. I'm a world citizen at this point. I'm an immigrant. But who isn't an immigrant? Artist Dona Larita has always wins. believed that. It's important to be able to share your story, even though it's hard. Every person in her project, the Lithuanian lives in Louisville, is an immigrant or refugee. But six months ago, that changed. Yeah, good. All right. And she found out someone she's known for a long time awesome. is living in a shadow, too. I'd like to know your story. The interview what, session with this photo what, subject is different. I'm really nervous. You are? Yeah, kind of. I really want some mint gum. This is her daughter. I don't know, you aren't going to have gum in an interview, sorry. Well, there are plenty of pictures of Julietta around her room. The one her mom plans to take serves another purpose. It was just like, surprise, you have brain cancer. And just like that, everything changed. Nobody wants to talk about anybody with cancer, let alone their child or a young adult. You know, it's just so unfair. And yet, it's here. Brain cancer is not fair, it never is. You've got it all. You've got it all. I loved my life, it was just perfect. The statistics of survival for glioblastoma are scary, but Jules will not be silenced by cancer. On her 32nd radiation treatment at UC Health, her very last day, she celebrates. She has so much love. But there are tough days too. The days she wishes she knew people like her. You know, like penguins huddle together when it's really yeah. cold, you know? And um, it's basically really cold when you have a brain tumor. It's really cold and you have to find people to huddle with. What do you feel you need most from your parents? No. At this point, like from your mother. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't, I can't <laughs> answer it. I have to hug you. <laughs> you guys all have one another and you relate to each other's experience, but I only have myself because I'm the only one. Dealing with this? Yep. Okay, you want to play it a little? So this is the new story Dona will tell through her photos. Let's bring okay. one more hand out. Teenagers battling cancer in the shadows. Okay, I need a little space. Yep, again, just to create that nice silhouette. So they can live their story out loud. I think these kids deserve to know that they're not alone, you know? Because I know I, they're not. It's just everybody's hidden, you know? And I think that it would, I know it would make a big difference for my daughter to know that she's not the only one that's her age, that's fighting for her life. <laughs> Dona believes the most important stories are the hardest to tell. Great. Great. Theirs is no exception. I love you. I love you. I won't say that on camera. <laughs> With photojournalist Ama Arthur Ozma, Katie Eastman, Nine News. Our next story is about a guy who does something that not many people do anymore. They call him the shoe doctor. And the constantly moving, constantly changing downtown Denver. There is a place that denies time. I can help you. And overwhelms the senses. Super old school, like the smell immediately when you walk in and everyone's super friendly. I haven't seen you in a while. 
I know how you been. Cobbler's right. Corner is a place that exudes the old values of owner Patrick Carlisle. I've grown up in the business, father, grandfather, father before his, all shooter family. For more than 40 years, Carlisle has been honing his craft the same way every day. It hasn't changed. I mean, the machines that I work on still look the same from 40, 50 years ago. And he doesn't just help the regular walk-in customer. You want to try them on? Carlisle has a reputation. Wife gets mad because I remember nothing she tells me, but I remember every shoe I touched. <laughs> He's Irish. I'm Irish-Italian, so we have a passionate relationship. Every Broadway show that's gone through town, I've uh, touched those shoes from Carol Channing to Sally Struthers. He draws in celebrities. They love Patrick. Everybody loves Patrick. Yeah, you were asking me on stars that I've met, Dan Haggerty. Grizzly Adams was one of my most favorite ones meeting. That guy was built. He draws in people from around the nation and the world. Thanks. Where are you from? New Zealand. Because he is known as the shoe doctor. I guess the theater kind of started calling me that because some of the stuff they bring in would just be completely shot. But not completely hopeless. It's an art. You know, it's, it's a flow. It's a steady living and a dying trade. Well, I think that's part of what makes uh, Patrick rare. His story kind of rare is that it's falling away. And a constantly moving, constantly changing world. One constant remains. I think we saved the shoe. What size? I'm excited. The shoe doctor who works like a shoe pastor. Been saving souls for living my whole life. With photojournalist Darren Rohde, Nelson Garcia, Nine News. 2018 has been a great year for storytellers. And we view it as our honor to share your stories from across Colorado. Keep those story ideas coming in. And have a happy new year. And Anne, for you, I do mean it this time.